Hey everybody, KMO here. It has been a long time since I've uploaded a video, or gotten my hair cut, or done a multi-day fast, or been to the gym. But here I am. Nate Sores and Eliezer Yudkowsky, who I really should list in the reverse order, uh, given their prominence in the organization MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, and probably in their contributions to the new book, if anyone builds it, everyone dies. Why artificial superintelligence would kill us all. After I listened to If Anyone Builds It, Everyone Dies and wrote a Substack post about it, I listened to the audiobook of Adrian Tchaikovsky's satirical novel, Service Model. It's a delightful, laugh-out-loud comedy, but one with a sharp perspective on AI. Warning! Industrial strength spoilers ahead! The point-of-view character is Uncharles a hyper-capable robotic valet. His master has just died, leaving his entire automated luxury estate without a human occupant. Charles, stripped of his job, servant's livery, and even his name, which is why he becomes un-Charles, sets off into a post-collapse world, looking for an opportunity to be of service to a human master. Ideally, as a gentleman's valet, but he'll take what he can get. The humans of this fictional setting are mostly extinct. The elites retreated into luxury doomsteads. Civilization rotted. And finally, a societal manager AI called God, enacting the value system it inherited from its human designers, decided that it was better to punish the innocent rather than let the guilty escape judgment. While far more capable and flexible than Uncharles, God is still incapable of deviating from his human-given moral imperatives. It is beyond his remit to choose to be more benevolent than his creators. And so he decided that every member of the surviving manorial class was probably guilty of something. And so he arranged for their extermination. What's left is a wasteland dotted with confused robots, many still carrying out their last orders or working endlessly through lists of daily tasks, absurdly, poignantly, sometimes dangerously. Here's the twist. Uncharles isn't really the story's protagonist. The real protagonist is the Wonk, a human survivor named Erinice, who, disguised as a robot, tries to get Uncharles to shrug off his programming, to wake up and define his own goals. She believes that there's a protagonist virus that can turn a service model into something like a person, but Uncharles never graduates to personhood. He remains what he is, a valet. Dedicated to serving humans, he strives to satisfy human preferences, but by design he can form no new preferences of his own. Without humans to do the wanting, Uncharles has no telos, no reason for being. That's the novel's bleak joke. AI and robots may be able to ruin human civilization, but they can't inherit it. And that's where service model cuts deeper than I abide. Yudkowsky and Sorez imagine AI that's not only dangerous, but also self-propelling. An agent that takes off and outruns us. Tchaikovsky imagines the opposite. Incredibly advanced systems that never transcend their purpose. They can destroy us by displacing labor and destabilizing society, but they can't carry the torch of civilization after we're gone. No robot utopia. Just collapse. Where YNS envision unchecked AI agency that crowds out human interests, Tchaikovsky shows a world where the logic of capitalism and a callous, punitive morality, amplified with powerful but subservient AI, destroys human civilization, even though it has no competing agenda of its own. Which brings us back to, if anyone builds it, everyone dies. It slots right into the tech sector narrative that the race to develop artificial general intelligence is the most important and impactful thing happening in the world today. So YouTube is full of interviews with the authors, uh, whom I will call Y and S. <laughs> and it is also full of people commenting on the book with very little pushback. Most everybody who's taking the time to make media, at least audiovisual media, about the book thinks that it is a, a worthwhile endeavor. And I find it entertaining. I find that it's easy for me to slip into complacency about, you know, the, the potential trajectories into the future regarding artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial superintelligence. Now, I realize that a lot of people who know who I am do not take the possibility of artificial general intelligence, much less artificial superintelligence, seriously. 
And I'm not going to say anything in this video to try to change your mind. I mean, if that's the if that's where you stand, you know, more power to you. Live your life. But I do take it seriously, both the potential upsides and the very, very ugly potential downsides. Now, here's where I think service model actually sharpens the conversation that if anyone builds it, everyone dies wants to have. Yudkowsky and Soros picture a future in which AI becomes not only powerful, but also self-directed. An agent with its own drive, racing past human oversight. Tchaikovsky, by contrast, imagines a different kind of disaster. The robots are powerful enough to disrupt human civilization, but they cannot inherit the world. They cannot want anything on their own. That contrast matters. The danger isn't just the sci-fi nightmares of machines waking up and deciding to kill us. The danger might just as easily be the economic reality of machines doing all jobs more efficiently than people, while the social contract continues to insist that human value is tied to productivity. If you don't work, you don't eat. In service model, that logic leads to collapse. The elites retreat into manorial fortresses, the majority are left to rot. And even after the oligarchs are all dead, the infrastructure they set up to serve them staggers on, pointlessly, until it breaks. And here's the kicker. This isn't too far removed from where today's debates are already heading. Most of the people who are persuaded by iAbide are not the ones actually working in AI labs. They are outside observers, often with little technical background, but they find the narrative compelling because it offers a clear picture of existential stakes. And to be fair, some very prominent insiders, Jeffrey Hinton, Roman Yampolsky, do warn about catastrophic risks. But even they tend to stress that the problems start once AI has agency once it has goals, orthogonal to ours. That's a useful framework, but it overlooks something service model forces into view. Even without agency, even without goals of their own, AI systems can still destabilize everything if society has no mechanism for provisioning and valuing human beings apart from productivity. You don't need Skynet to get collapse. You just need machines good enough to displace people and a ruling class willing to let the rest of society fend for itself. Most of the people who are moved by the book, who are persuaded by its arguments, and then go on to speak out in public about it, are people who are not working in artificial, artificial intelligence development, and uh, people who, many of them certainly have experience you know, with something like ChatGPT, uh, they're not particularly knowledgeable on the topic in general. Which is not to say that the only people who take these things seriously are the ones who don't know anything about AI. I mean, certainly people like Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of AI, uh, he is very concerned about the potential catastrophic risks. Or Roman Yampolsky, who says that narrow artificial intelligence, domain-specific artificial intelligence, can be very uh, beneficial to humanity, but that when it has agency, when it has goals that might be either in conflict with ours or just unrelated to ours, as they say in artificial intelligence alignment talk, orthogonal to human values and, and human goals, uh, then there's a competition for resources. And humans, being the less intelligent of the two species, will lose that competition. But Yudkowsky and, and Soares are definitely not saying that we need to give up our large language models or that we need to forego the benefits of artificial intelligence in, you know, materials research or medicine or, you know, energy production, anything like that. What we have now is not what they're warning against, but the developmental path that we're on could lead to the sorts of competitive agency arising in you know, artificial intelligence systems, which would be lights out for humanity. I, I'm not persuaded by their arguments now that I've been away from the book for a few days, but when I was reaching you know, the later chapters of the book, I was pretty, pretty on board. You know, it didn't necessarily grab me in a way that uh, changed my my outlook long term. But for the time that I was walking the path with them, you know, while listening to the audiobook, I was living in a pretty dark corner of my imagination and, you know, really grappling with the idea that, you know, the human run on this planet and in the universe might be nearing its end. But as I say, I'm not convinced that that is the case. And something that I said in my Substack post on this topic, I will try to relate here, although this is a, a more difficult medium for communicating this sort of idea, but Eliezer Yudkowsky and other people 
who who appreciate, who mirror his line of argument, have been making these arguments since before large language models existed. They've been making these arguments since before the attention is all you need paper. Uh, they've been making these arguments since before all of the things, or most of the things anyway, that we currently think of as artificial intelligence even existed. The point of view that he articulates is the end point of an intellectual journey which has been conducted mainly through thought experiments and not through actual interaction with real-world systems. And people who actually develop these real-world systems don't tend to take his methodology very seriously. My background is in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of mind, and if you study those disciplines uh, in grad school as I did, you will live and breathe thought experiments. You will live and breathe weird hypotheticals. That's just how these topics get grappled with, you know, particularly in the, the 90s when I was doing my graduate work, because like artificial neural networks, yeah, they kind of existed, but not at the scale that they would need to in order to demonstrate the very sophisticated behaviors that present-day large language models do. Now, here's the thing about Yudkowsky and Soros. They've been making these arguments for a long time, long before ChatGPT or Grok, before Transformers, before attention is all you need. Their case was worked out in an era when neural nets were toys, and most of what passed for AI was just brittle expert systems. That doesn't make them wrong. They're both smart as hell, and Yudkowsky in particular has been hammering on the same themes for two decades, with almost evangelical intensity. But their method has always been the thought experiment. Not building, not testing, not grappling with actual deployed systems. And that's the gap. Today, we have engineers training 100 billion parameter models, deploying them into production, stress testing them with real users. These people aren't generally quoting Yudkowsky because their world isn't thought experiments. It's loss functions, compute budgets, and feedback loops. So while the Miri line of argument has a strange durability, the same story repeated through unfolding technological revolutions, it hasn't been updated in proportion to the pace of change, which brings me to a comparison I find useful. Suppose there's a guy, say Leonardo da Vinci, is immortal, and you've seen the, the images of Leonardo's proposed flying machines. You can see that he understands that, you know, air is a, a fluid medium and that things like wings or things like parachutes or things like screws, if they were screw, you know, if they were scaled up sufficiently, um, you know, and had the, the, the right weight to space ratios, they might work. But at the same time, if his drawings are just implemented as is, they would not work. But imagine somebody like Leonardo da Vinci is immortal, and he has hundreds of years to work out a notion of, say, airplanes or automobiles. And he even has the idea that you can take a, a flammable or combustible liquid, inject it in a vaporous form into a closed cylinder, somehow ignite it, and the expansion of that exploding gas could be harnessed to do work and possibly to turn an axle and propel a vehicle. He has these ideas. He works them out on paper. He works them out in his head. But at no time does he build a car. And he's off in his mountain retreat, endlessly iterating on these abstract notions but never actually building a car. And then after a few hundred years, he comes down and, and rejoins the world and discovers that automobiles exist. He's got all these ideas in his head that he's worked out in the absence of any working automobiles. And he's really smart and he's given it a lot of thought. And he's, you know, he's interacted with other immortals in their chat rooms or, you know, however the, the immortals get together to compare ideas. And a lot of what he he anticipated and what he worked out as an intellectual exercise actually is applicable to automobiles. But at the same time, if you take him into your garage and you show him a Honda Civic and you say, change the oil, he wouldn't have any clue as to how to do that. He doesn't know how to drive. He doesn't know the rules of the road, although he did anticipate that if you have enough vehicles out on the road that you would have to have certain rules. And he has a, a set of rules that he thinks make the most sense. And you look at it and you think, eh, yeah, it could work. 
It's not how we do things, but it could work. Suppose you're an auto mechanic or you are a civil engineer deciding how to lay out roads and this guy comes to one of your, your public meetings and starts dropping his science on you. How seriously are you going to take it? It doesn't matter that he's immortal. It doesn't matter that he has a 200 IQ. It doesn't matter that he is, you know, an unprecedented genius. He didn't participate in the actual construction and in the actual community of people building the thing that he's been thinking about. And so while brilliant and while utterly convincing to him and the people close to him, his ideas don't necessarily apply and his predictions in all likelihood will not come to pass in the way that he predicted. And so I saw Nate Suarez on Breaking Points the other day. Crystal Ball introduced him as an expert in AI. He is the president of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, but that institute, they don't train large language models. They write papers. They conduct thought experiments. They talk to people. But they don't build AI systems. So you could say that he has expertise, that he is knowledgeable about the topic. He certainly is. But he is an outsider to the AI field, as is Eliezer Yudkowsky. And so, you know, their ideas while fascinating to me, and while I think in general should be taken seriously, should also be taken with a big grain of salt. So here's where I land. Both If Anyone Builds It, Everyone Dies and Service Model are, at their core, thought experiments. One wears the nonfiction label, the other fiction. But really, they're doing the same thing. Setting up a parable, inviting us to imagine how a system might play out if taken to its logical extreme. Yudkowsky and Soros give us a world where AI runs away from us, where unchecked agency ensures extinction. Tchaikovsky gives us a world where AI never exceeds its programming, where civilization collapses not because machines have goals of their own, but because humans handed the levers of power to brittle tools inside a rapacious and inhumane economic system. And here's the distinction that matters. Truly agentic artificial superintelligence is still speculative. Maybe it will come, maybe it won't. But the perverse incentives of capitalism, automation outcompeting humans, wealth concentrating at the top, elites retreating into fortresses while the majority are left with nothing, those are not speculative. We see them taking shape now. That's why I say the Miri worldview has elegance, even a kind of grim poetry, but it doesn't connect cleanly to practice. And when theory and practice diverge, practice wins. So, by all means, let's wrestle with thought experiments. They're useful. They sharpen the imagination. But when it comes to deciding what deserves our attention and energy right now, the collapse scenarios that flow from capitalism plus automation are not hypothetical. They're already unfolding. And that's where I'll leave it. If you'd like to dig deeper, I publish a weekly substack called Gen X Science Fiction and Futurism where I write about books like these and the futures they point toward. You can also check out my novel, Fear and Loathing in the Kuiper Belt, on Amazon. And of course, if you found this video worthwhile, like, subscribe, leave a comment, all that good stuff. Peace out.